So I want to uh, again invite uh, Melissa and look forward to your presentation. Hey, thanks, Dave. Hi, everybody. Hi. So, yes, as he said, uh, my name is Melissa. I'm from here in Charlotte. And uh, we're going to talk about Power BI tonight. So, my first question that I would like to know we have a bit of an extended session. Um, we we'll definitely won't go past 10, 10 30. Okay, no, just kidding. But we do have a little over an hour, almost, almost an hour and a half. So, that gives us a little bit of flexibility with how we cover this material, and if we don't go exactly in order of my presentation, I'm perfectly fine with that. So what I'd like to know from you all is, how many of you have Power BI in production right now, running uh, workloads and figuring out how to administer and deploy and run it in a, in a good way? I did it at a former company. Okay. Um, how many of you are just starting to learn what makes up all the pieces of Power BI? All right, so that's really about 90% of the room, and that helps me with where to spend time and where to start. All right, so um, as Nate said, uh, about eh, three months ago, I, I went uh, independent. And what I want to do is show you my website, not just to show you it, but to show you where you can find a couple of things tonight that you will find uh, helpful. So on my website, under Community Resources, the first thing that you're going to want to do is um, download this diagram that's at the top. We are going to walk through this tonight. This is Power BI. <laughs> so if you thought we're going to talk about a reporting tool, it's a little bigger than that. So here's where to find uh, that diagram. The other thing under that same menu, under presentations, um, at the top right here is a, you can get a PDF of these slides that you're going to see tonight. And then I also encourage you this one here, we're going to grab a couple little topics from this other presentation as well. Um, but if you're interested in this tonight's topic, the second one uh, will be interesting to you as well. And, and you saw this one just a couple weeks ago. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with kind of an overview of what are all of the pieces. And then we're going to basically walk through two, three, and four are a little bit sequential. We're going to talk about well, what tools do we have to offer or create content. And then if we're going to publish the content, what are our options for delivering that content? And item three is the Power BI service, which is where we get the most uh, features and functionality and then number four will be, well, here's the other places we could publish to if we want. Um, and then we're going to finish up with, here's the other important pieces in your overall architecture that we didn't cover between two, three, and four. So that's our flow. So first of all, what is Power BI? And for some, especially system administrator type people that maybe are familiar with something like reporting services, um, or other tools like that get surprised with how broad and deep Power BI is because it's not just a reporting tool. It is a tool that we acquire data from many sources, we can prepare it, we can clean it, we can data model it, we can create calculations, and then we create reports and then we publish it. So it's actually a, a pretty broad set of things. And this is intending to represent that broad set of things. And give me just a moment.
So on the left, we have data sources. And the idea behind Power BI is making it easy for you to get data from nearly anywhere. So some of you probably have a beautifully constructed data warehouse or reporting system of some type that has a whole lot of things that your data analysts might need to pull data out of. Or you might not. And so the idea is, even if you do have a data warehouse, you might also need to get some data from online somewhere, or add in something from a spreadsheet, or add something from a desktop. <coughs> and Power BI makes that really easy. And I'm going to demo Power BI desktop here for you uh, in just a couple minutes. If we move over from there, that second column is all about content authoring. And so we've got a few different tools that we're gonna talk through. Power BI Desktop is the main tool. Um, moving to the third area, that's our delivery, collaboration, sharing area. At the top, we've got the Power BI service. And we're gonna spend a good bit of time just walking through and demoing all the different pieces of the Power BI service and what you might use for what some considerations um, that you might use as well. And then where it really is very strong at also is this idea of embedded content. So if you've got, say, a custom application, I've even seen customers embedding Power BI reports inside of Salesforce. So um, turning around and saying, I don't need to make my users visit a reporting portal. I can just embed it inside of that application so they can keep being productive and stay where they're at and see the report right next to whatever it is they're doing. There's a whole bunch of options for that that we're going to talk about. Um, there's also this notion of down here of a thing called Power BI Report Server. And some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with SQL Server Reporting Services, yeah? I see a few nods, yeah. So what this is is the same exact thing Plus, it supports Power BI files in addition to those RDLs or those reporting services reports. Um, and we'll talk about this uh, towards the end, but that gives customers that aren't necessarily comfortable with using the cloud-based service another place to be able to publish. And that might be for your organization, or that might be, say, one department that says, I'm not comfortable um, with publishing it out there, but I am, I am comfortable down here. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Way on the far right, um, there's a lot of elements to system administration. So Power BI integrates with Office 365. Um, that's actually where we set up our licensing. That's where we buy our subscriptions. Um, we have integration with <coughs> Azure Active Directory as well. So that underpins everything these days, right? Uh, Azure Active Directory talks to O365, and it talks to Power BI, and it talks to um, all of these other services um, like the uh, platform services. So do you all have folks in your organization that are starting to get excited about Power Apps? And well, Flow has been renamed to Power Automate, so now it's part of the, we have the more and more and more Power things. Um, so anyways. AAD underpinning all of that is a really good thing because that means we don't have a separate security model. It's really good. Um, there's an administration center, so kind of in the, the far right middle there, um, and I'll show you what that looks like a little bit. That's basically for your administrators to turn some knobs and uh, basically enable or disable certain features uh, based on your data culture, if you will. So how free and flexible are you going to allow your user population as opposed to uh, locking things down a little bit more? So in this world, we are talking about self-service BI. So Microsoft's main initial intention is all about let's make things as easy as possible for the data analysts to do their job. And then certain organizations, of course, especially like or highly regulated organizations need to crank some things back a little bit. And I'll, I'll show you a few of those options as well. Some of the new stuff that's just starting to come out um, over here under security and compliance. So um, if you have started using uh, some
some of the functionality <coughs> to tag your documents, so Word documents, Excel documents, things like that. Power BI is actually hooking into um, the Azure Information Protection policies there to where you can start tagging these reports and they'll follow. Uh, so if it's a highly privileged report with uh, personally identifiable information on it, we can start hooking in to some of that and it follows uh, the same patterns that some of your other documents in the org do. So that part's really cool. It's, it's just went into preview like in the last week or two. <laughs> so it's super new. Um, and then the Azure Information Protection, that piece is new as well and is about, um, I want to know if there's something risky that's happening. So uh, a lot of exports and downloads that are unexpected and I want to be alerted and, and kind of look for that unusual risky behavior. Did you have a question or were you stretching? No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the notion of a gateway. So um, the idea there is to get to some of these data sources, those are going to be in your corporate network behind your firewall, and we basically need a way to connect into those securely. That's what the data gateway does. And um, so we've got some, some considerations there. And then at the bottom right, um, those are really just some other, all optional, uh, but other options we can use for uh, helping us to administer the system. Okay, so let's, let's go from that 10,000 foot level down to kind of start at the very beginning and what are our offerings. Before I do that, any comments or questions? I, I'd like to hear your perspective during the course of this on whether or not you can start all on premise and then move stuff out. And with that, are we talking about a data platform architecture or are we talking just Power BI? Power BI. Um, yeah, so can we start on premises? And that would be our Power BI report server. Yep. Um, and, and move. And I think that the answer is yes, given that your users will tolerate that disruption. But a whole lot of the things that you're going to see me demo here in a few minutes in the Power BI service are only available in the Azure. Are only available in the Over online 65. service. Right. So if you start with that on premises report server, you're, what you're getting is a really basic. Uh, folder and file level report navigation system, right? Very, uh, very basic, and that is the vision for that. Microsoft does not have a vision to bring feature parity to the service and say, oh, we're going to let you do everything on prem. We so, just have like a year time frame before the CISO gets on board with. Ah, uh, okay. So could you buy yourself some time and let people start using? Power BI with thinking. that. And I think that would be a better choice than asking people to collaborate on a file system. Um, opening up those PBIX files in Power BI desktop and sharing it that way is really painful. Yep. So I think you'd be better off with Well, that right now they share Excel workbooks, so. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. True. Right. Anything's better than that? They, they, yes. Yes, yes. Um, okay, I, I, I might come back to that, but let me, let me stay okay. on point here for a second. Um, I, I might uh, refrain from some commentary, we'll see. So we have four main authoring tools in our, in our family of Power BI. The main one, Power BI Desktop, that one really is our tool of choice. And that's where we can do all of those things that we mentioned earlier. With cleaning up data, modeling it, doing our reports, etc. Now, Excel is an alternative. If you've heard of uh, Power Query, Power Pivot, right? Those are the Excel add-in al alternatives to what's in Power BI Desktop. And typically, when people start using Excel is when you've got analysts that say, I can't give up my pivot tables and my pivot charts. So that's an alternative, but it's, it, 
it, uh, it's not as good is, is kind of a strong statement to make. It's a very different experience than Power BI Desktop. So I would say only use Excel if you have someone that really insists on that. Yeah. Can you open a Excel workbook that has Power, like Power Pivot, mm -hmm. inside of Desktop? Will it open those files? Can you provide them? Is it my question? Is if we've got them hooked on Excel? Yeah. Can we move them with those? things that they spent hours figuring out. Right, always. right. To you can move the model. You can migrate it okay. to desktop. You can also, if they say, hey, I'm happy with this Excel file, you can publish it to the Power BI service. And I'm going to show you one and what okay. that looks Thank like. Um, so so it, it can be done. Um, if I forget, later when we talk about a feature called Analyze in Excel, um, that's got a huge limitation. So don't let me forget to tell you that when we get to that piece. Then we've got a thing called our paginated report builder. So this is basically taking the reporting services report builder tool, putting a Power BI skin on it, and then recently they have started adding some new features. But this is what you create those RDL reports with in this tool. Then you've got Another flavor of Power BI Desktop, and they call it, you know, Power BI Desktop for Report Server. And this one is important if, in fact, you really are going to publish to Report Server. And the reason for that is this next slide, the release cadence. So Power BI Desktop gets updates every single month. Um, and sometimes intra-month as well for bug fixes. Um, the Excel and the Paginated Report Builder um, don't have a published release cadence that I, that I know of, so they get updates once in a while. Especially Excel, uh, Power Query and Power Pivot get updates dramatically slower than they hit Power BI Desktop. How about our relational database access users? They seem to be left out here. Access. Well, and when you say left out here, what do you mean by that? Well, a lot of us have, you know, information in an access database to you know, query and stuff like that. So you're saying access doesn't really exist today. It, it, we save it in an Excel file and then, you know, use Power BI Desktop to uh, access the information now? Yeah, so access wouldn't be part of the Power BI family why it's not included here. So, you know, I think it's then a matter of with the tools you want your analysts to use, as an organization, do you want to encourage them to use Power BI data models instead of access data models? Well, we don't need access anymore. All we have to do is use Power BI. I but, would agree But we with have that. to migrate our access files to basically an Excel spreadsheet. Well, the question, I guess, is: Is it are the AC, the FDBs or ACC, whatever? Yeah. Are they um, data sources for? Power they could BI? be a data source oh. for a Power BI data model. Careful of this question; he's a communist. <laughs> okay. Um, this last one, though, uh, it gets updated three times a year, and they've they've got a published cadence, uh, and so. This tool gets updated at the same time as Power BI Report Server. Since that's slower, what can happen if you use the regular Power BI Desktop is then you start using a feature that isn't supported over on Report Server, and oops, it worked on my laptop. It doesn't work when I deploy it. So you can run those two side by side if you happen to be an analyst that has to publish some things over to Report Server and some things over to Power BI Service. It, it does work. I haven't run into someone that actually has that job responsibility, but there's somebody someone that does. Why do you call it desktop? I mean, the laptop's a desktop in a way. It, yeah, it's the desktop equivalent of the, it's the design tool on desktop. Yeah, that's why they call it. Yeah. So, the other thing to know, um, if you've got people collaborating on the same file, so 
Files like Excel and Word these days are very multi-user friendly, right? You see the little thing in there that, oh, Atlas is in there too, uh-huh. Um, Power BI Desktop is not. And so if I'm going to work on something and then I need to pitch it over to you to work on some DAX calculations, right? Because you're better at those than I am. Um, I'm going to have to close it, have you reopen it. We both have to be on the exact same version. So if you um, are allowed in your organization to deploy apps through the Windows Store, that's the most seamless for users because even those little bug fixes, nobody even knows they're coming in, right? It just happens as opposed to um, you need to push it through you know, System Center or whatever tool um, y'all use for that kind of stuff. PBIX files hosted. So if I'm using, for example, Teams, which is basically a SharePoint back end, yep. is there an issue with having those PBIX files, I guess, in a blob somewhere? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that. So let's go back for a second, which I knew we'd do this a whole bunch. So let's go back a second and talk about file storage, right? So we, we kind of talked a little bit about these authoring tools. Right now, I'm going to show you what Power BI Desktop actually looks like in a second. But you're right. Where do we where do we save that PBIX file? And because uh, what we like to have is a versioned document store for it, OneDrive or SharePoint is sort of the ideal choice because business users um, are familiar with it. They can utilize it. Way less. Uh, difficult for business users to deal with than say a source control repository <coughs> um, and you get version and that's a really good thing because you know then you can fall back into an old version so where that the answer to your question is wherever you save that that particular file um, but that's usually the recommended location as opposed to um, file systems are fine um, but what you what I uh, often uh, advise my clients to do in projects is create a uh, uh, like a OneDrive location and a team, etc. If you would like, put all of your Power BI development files in there as well. Then, if you've got other files from the Power BI service, we haven't talked about exporting data and that kind of stuff yet. But as you can imagine, we can export. Well, where should those live too? Hey, maybe that same location, right? And then you kind of have this area where you know that this is where my data artifacts live. And here's the thing that we haven't talked about yet that is that kind of blows some people's minds initially. But when we create um, content in Power BI Desktop, the vast majority of the time we're literally importing data into that PBIX file. So this is, we have four modes for connectivity and we're going to talk about those. But if we just click, click and use the default experience, we're going to be bringing in data. So that means it's, we're, we're storing data inside that file, which means we need to be particularly careful about where where those files are sitting. Yep. All right, so let me, let me give you one more piece of info and then we'll take a quick look at Power BI Desktop. So, yeah, yeah. All right, so we've got in Power BI Desktop, we've got a query editor, we've got a data pane, which is where we do calculations and a relationships pane. We've got the report creation experience, and then we've got this second separate thing, creating row level security. Inside the query editor, it's all graphical, but everything you do in the UI creates code behind the scenes. So if you are so inclined, you can learn this Power Query formula language and do a lot more than what is able to be done in the user interface. The next area has a different language behind it. All of the calculations are using what we call DAX, Data Analysis Expressions, which is a separate language than the M scripts. And then we've got data modeling concerns. So those of you that have uh, 
developed star schemas or data warehousing type systems in the past, Power BI loves that format. Power BI hates a whole bunch of little normalized tables. So if you think, oh, I've got a source system, I'm just going to pull in 60 normalized tables, hook them up via relationships and report on them, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to do some data modeling. And that's a skill. For lots of visuals, I mean, data visualization is a huge profession these days, right? There's actually a whole lot to learn to do that extremely effectively. And row level security, which is defined inside the PBIX file, um, is also done using DAX. So let me show you what this tool looks like. Um, step out of the way. So what we have is several different areas on the left. So I've got a, the first one is a report K on the left, then I've got data, and I've got a model. And then the other key area, it doesn't really have a pane on the left, it's edit query. So where we would start everything with this in terms of data access is in this edit queries area. So I have four tables in my particular model here. And what makes it really interesting is that Power, this is Power Query or the Query Editor. We have this notion of steps. So if you've ever done macros in Excel, this is sort of the same thing, but way, way better. If you have a data analyst in your organization that takes some file maybe they get from the bank at the end of every month. And then you know what they always do? They delete column three, they reformat column four, they filter, right? they kind of do that same cleanup. Yeah, that's what this is all about. So if I click on step two, right, I can see that, okay, this is called catalog description is, is the name of that column, right? In the next step, what did I do? I renamed columns. So, oh, I wanted a catalog space DESC, right? And then in the next step, I removed some columns and I changed the data type, right? And so you feed in the updated data next month and it just reperforms those steps. And we can see the state of the data before and after the step. And so across this ribbon at the top, We've got a whole lot of different activities that we can do to tidy up this data. And then you heard me say a couple of minutes ago this idea of a power query formula language. Um, this is what that looks like. And so should you choose to learn how to write it in that way, you can do that too, and you don't have to use the GUI. So let's say we've got our uh, initial data preparation done over here in the query editor. So then the next thing we've got is the actual, the actual data. Remember we said we're importing data more often than not. We'll talk about the alternatives. So here, um, here's where my four tables are listed over here. Um, and we can, we can see you know, literally what the data looks like. So it kind of looks like Excel, but this is a data model. So it acts you know, a little bit differently. It's not like I can go in and change this is not cell you know, B2, where I can literally go and change it like Excel. It doesn't work like that. So here's my data, and I can start creating calculations. So let's say I want to create, uh, here's a super simple one. Uh, here's number of sales lines. Here's my count rows for that particular table. Super simple. Uh, Total order quantity. Here's just a, a, a sum. Um, DAX is the most powerful thing in terms of getting Power BI to do magical stuff. Um, there are some people where this is really what they focus on and are very deep. All right, then we have the notion of relationships. So this is a terrible data model. For my quick little demo, but really, all I want you to pay attention to is that we have data relationships. They are 
usually should be one to many. Um, and so between the data model, the calculations, and the relationships, that's kind of one person with regard to skills. And then you've got the reporting side, right? So here's just a few little simple reports. Power BI is known for being very interactive. So what I just did is I clicked on this bar um, next to my, my Road 250 product model. And actually, let me click on uh, something different. Here what I clicked on is actually in the legend I clicked black. And what it's done is it's cross-filtered this other report so I can quickly see that, oh, that is approximately, what's that, 30, 40% of my road bikes that I sell are in the black product color. You, you so can quickly always, see it if you can see it. It's too small for us to yeah. grasp, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, we get the gist. Of yep. The, so cross-filtering and highlighting and dynamic behavior um, is, is inherently built in uh, to Power BI, and it does that based on the data model and those relationships, and not because you did something that said, make this behave this way. There's a little, you can override a few things like that with regard to behavior. Um, okay, so that's your whirlwind tour of what the desktop tool looks like. Now you've heard me say a couple times, we're importing data, we're importing data, and that's usually what most data models are imported. So if you're familiar with um, column store indexes in SQL Server, right, and uh, it can compress that data significantly down depending on the cardinality of your data. So if you've got a column with, say, 50 states, right, and you've got 30 million rows, well, that's going to compress well, as opposed to a unique ID, which is going to compress it all. This is in-memory column store type of uh, data store behind the scenes. So that's where we're going to get the best performance. Our other options are direct query. This would be acting like reporting services, right? We're going to send a query to that underlying source. Live connection is a really important uh, way to connect if we already have, say, analysis services cube. Um, or, 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 or I have a Power BI data model already published, and I want to create new reports. And rather than re-import that data, I want to point to that data model that's already there. That um, is, is one of the key things that um, new users mess up on. They, they create multiple reports, they re-import the data all the time, and they end up in the situation of, oh, I have four data models that almost look exactly the same, right? And then you learn how to do this live connection. And then composite is, is kind of a, a, a quasi between the, between the first two. So lots of decisions there with regard to um, what your needs are for real-time data, security, etc. If you've ever heard someone say, Power BI is a model-based tool, right? That's, that's why. It's not a reporting tool, it's a model-based tool. So there's a few people in our industry that like to um, repeat that a lot, and I think it's really important um, because getting that data model right is one of the most important things that you can do um, to have a good implementation. Okay, so let's talk about, now that we, we have a Power BI file and we are ready to publish it and share it with your coworkers. The main ways that we have, and you kind of already saw some of this on that big dense diagram, the Power BI service, we've got the report server, and we've got embedding solutions. So let's talk about the service. And we actually do this first. Um, and then, then we'll pop over and, and look at it for real. Let me give you a little terminology first. Now, in desktop already, you saw a data set, right? That data pane. And you saw a report. When I get to the service, I can start taking pieces of that report. Remember how that report had a chart and a chart and a few numbers? I can pin pieces up to a dashboard. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. 
let's say I want to do that again, and then I've got a dashboard in the service that has elements from multiple reports. And that came from a different data set. And maybe I've got a third report, and then I've got this report that's taking elements uh, like a chart and being published to multiple dashboards. And then I can do something like this over here, and I'll demo what this looks like. It doesn't have to have a report in order to get onto a uh, dashboard. We can uh, start hitting stuff from Q&A or from Quick Insights, and I'll show you what both of those look like. These are all objects that live inside the scope of what we call a workspace. So let me show you what that actually looks like now that you've heard the terminology. All right, Peyton is my, is my demo user here. This is, uh, this is the home screen. So what we've got here are basically all of the objects such as reports and dashboards and apps that are used commonly um, in Peyton's account here. I've got a panel over here on the left, and it's got a little uh, item here that means I can uh, collapse it if I want. So I can see my favorites as well. So I've got a few different items to be my favorites. Um, I've got a recent menu, so here's just a whole bunch of stuff I've used recently. Apps we'll talk about here in just a little bit. They're a, a specific thing. Um, and then we have the notion of workspaces. So in Power BI Service, everybody has this thing called My Workspace. So it's my personal area, only I can access it in terms of editing content. And then we have the, the other type is called an app workspace. You want to put the vast majority of your content in regular app workspaces. So if it's in my workspace and I go on vacation and I've shared content out to somebody else and there's a change or a problem, nobody else can get into it to edit it. Um, app workspaces is where all of your commonly used or mission critical reports should be should be good. So only use my workspace for you know your scratch pad, your testing, your playing, your learning, etc. Alright, so down here I'm gonna I'm gonna go to my sales analytics workspace. And I've got here's my dashboards pane. Here's my reports pane workbooks. So here's that Excel workbook that I published, and here's some data sets. On that slide, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. So I see this as loading, and some of your, right, the more interesting things, it's going to have a lot of computational time behind it, right? You could potentially, there are two questions I have. One is, who's paying for the CPU time? How is that charged? Okay. And the second question I have is, how do we insulate our data from, I mean, the reason we have reporting services is we don't want end users to muck around. <laughs> so, you see where I'm going? I do. And so, I'm going to defer, I think, both questions, especially the first one, though, um, because that gets into, do I use Power BI Premium? And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that here shortly, where, we're, where we literally have purchased our own CPU and memory in our dedicated area. Um, where, unless you're in Power BI Premium, which we'll talk about here in a bit, but um, this is, this is a, uh, a service, right? It's software as a service for Microsoft. So, so yeah, um, there's multiple customers on the platform. Obviously, it's secure. Um, in terms of you only seeing your data, but you know it is a it is a service, and so um, so yeah. Let's let's talk about the CPU question when we get to premium, and, and the other question's more of a philosophical self-service BI question, right? Yeah. Um, and which we could literally talk about for the whole next hour. So I think that comes back to um, how many people are allowed to 
access data and publish data, how do you govern the entire platform? And um, as, as being self-employed, um, the, the biggest thing I'm spending time on right now, about two-thirds of my time, is, is I'm creating some training content. The first thing I'm creating are my governance, because it's such a big pain point, right? Um, and there's no, it, it's very difficult to answer because you've got a whole bunch of different user types usually in your, in your organization, right? And so you, there are some people that you can give a little bit of permissions to and just a little bit of training and they'll be fine. Then you've got other people that need pretty deep permissions and so forth. And it gets, it gets very philosophical and very difficult. But, um, but I'll show you a few tenant settings in a little bit where you know things you can at least consider. Um, although locking down things generally just leads users to figure out how they're going to do it. Whereas in the Power BI service, everything is logged, and you have you have audit trails. So you know, I mean, if if there are things of concern that are happening, if you don't lock them down, but you instead audit them and understand what's happening, and then figure out. Is it a problem that's, you know, sometimes better than you do? I'm going to start with their report. I might go to product sales analysis. This is actually the same report you just saw in Power BI Desktop. This Wi-Fi connection is probably not the greatest. Um, when it comes up, what you're going to see is that it's going to come up on page two of the report. And so one little tip I'll give you is that it's kind of interesting when you publish it from Power BI Desktop up here, whatever page you were on uh, at the time is what will become the default page. So in Desktop, we saw the multiple pages at the bottom. In the service, we see the multiple pages over here on the left. And here's that. It's coming up. Uh, on page two because that's just where my mouse happened to be. So um, we have a nice little filter pane over here, um, which can be shown in yeah. Can I press a question? So yeah. in the Power BI world, what's the difference between dashboard and the report? I am glad you asked that. So I'm going to answer that in just a moment. Oh, okay. So a report is always published from Power BI Desktop. A dashboard is a service-only concept. So the best thing you can do is never call your reports that you created in, in Power BI Desktop, never call it a dashboard because that confuses things. Dashboards are an actual technical thing in the service. So, so yes, I will, I will clear that up for you here in just a second. Um, so as we are interacting with our um, report here, you know, and all that same, you know, cross-filtering uh, and so forth applies. What I also have, and yeah, my, my Zoom, I like to draw on the screen a lot when I present, so I've, I've been struggling. I have a brand new laptop that's illegal, and you know how uh, some laptops, when you hit the function keys, you have to actually click function? I haven't switched that in my bio settings yet, so my, my drawing thing isn't working, so my bad. Anyway. When we are hovering on any one item inside of a report, we have um, these little items that contextually kind of pop up for each one. And one of them is a pin visual. So if I say, let me go to this line total over here of 708. And then it says, where do you want to pin this to? I want to pin it to, let's just, Let's just for fun say, I want a new dashboard, and I'm going to call it my test dashboard, and say pin. And if I go back to, on my main workspace page, now I have a new object here. So dashboards are created only in the service. And so far I only have this because I pinned it from that report we were just looking at. Now, if I go to one that's already created, um, here, you'll recognize this guy here from the report we just visited. If I click on this, so on a dashboard, it doesn't have that same interactivity. If I click on this, it takes me to the underlying report. 
If I go back a second and I click on the second one, this one takes me to a completely different report, right, that you've never seen before. Now if I click on the third one, um, you don't know this, these sets of reports, so this is hard for you to see, but notice that it says exit focus mode up here at the, at the top of the menu. Um, that tells me, oh, I went to just one thing, I didn't go to an entire report. That means this is something that got pinned, not from a report, but from another, another mechanism. So, so reports, here, I'll use my, my friend comments at the top. So reports get published from Power BI Desktop, <coughs> dashboards get created in the service. And dashboards are this composite of items from one or more reports. Now, if we talk about, well, what are the other ways that I can pin, pin data to my dashboard? There's a couple of different ways. Done. Um, it will tell me, 
and then I'll get to review the results, and it will give me uh, various charts, and I can pin those to the dashboard as well. Okay, it'll tell me when it's done. There's a couple other things that I really wanted to talk about on reports, uh, and one of them is exports. So we can export to PowerPoint, PDF, uh, and we can also create a pivot table in Analyze in Excel. What's going to happen here if I do that Analyze in Excel? So even though I'm starting from a report, right? What it's going to do is it's going to take the data set underneath the report. It's going to connect it. It's basically an ODC file, for those of you familiar with that. Create a nice little empty pivot table for me to start creating. Now, here's the thing. You, when you start using Analyze in Excel, I love it because you're reusing a data set that's already published. You can't publish it back to the service though. The Excel workbooks that the service supports have to have an embedded data model. Analyze in Excel with that line connection doesn't qualify. So, unfortunately, that doesn't work. Um, but I wanted to show you what it looks like when we export. So email, email subscriptions, so here's what the, what the email subscription looks like when it gets sent. Um, you get an email, right? You get the visual sort of embedded in the email, and then you get, uh, it, and that will link back to the original report if you click on it. And it's got a PNG attachment, right? So subscriptions is something that um, in the tenant settings you can define if you want to allow everyone to create subscriptions or if you only want to allow certain members of the, of the organization to be able to create subscriptions because it starts emailing around images and pictures of data, right? The other export, um, if you export out to PDF, you just get literally what the two pages look like. So a nice, clean PDF copy, that's good. I like it. The, the PowerPoint export goes a little step further. It's kind of interesting. They give you, um, whether you like the black background or not, gives you this little metadata, right? When, when did we produce this export? Um, and then each page turns into this chart. And again, it's just a picture. It's just an export, um, but it's, it's uh, kind of interesting. And then each one has hyperlinks, though, back to the original. So all those activities in terms of um, exporting and printing um, can be controlled in, this, in the tenant settings. The other thing in that vein, so subscriptions, we looked at the, at the output. Um, here's my here's my top sales subscription. Um, I can define um, the frequency and so forth. Your subscriptions are report page by page, as opposed to setting both pages at once. The other interesting thing is comments. So over here we can see that. Oh, two months ago I said something about how the returns had a pretty big impact, and you know Tony responded with with such and such. So that's a really nice uh, collaboration type of a feature. All right, the only other thing in this vein that I really want to show you that's super cool is this idea of bookmarks. So let me get rid of the this. So we've got this filter paint on filter paint on the right. And let's say I only want to see, you know, the black, blue, and the red uh, for, for my color of my product. Over here under bookmarks, what I can do is I can do add a personal bookmark, and, and we'll call that black, blue, red. I could make that my default view if I want, and hit save. So this is really cool, right? So the next time I come in, if I have modified the various filters, I can save this idea of a personal bookmark. So that's that's really cool. Let me pop over quickly 
And since I've brought up tenant settings a couple of times, let me just show you quickly what those are. So those are a really important thing that your Power BI administrator sets. Um, incidentally, if you step back a second, um, you have Office 365 global admins, you have Azure global admins, basically one and the same. Um, a Power BI admin is a individual role and anybody who's already a global admin is also a Power BI admin. Um, but a Power BI admin can adjust these settings. So here we can we can define some some custom help uh, URLs. So for instance, essentially what it does is whoops, sorry, the, the question mark down here, it customizes instead of going to the Microsoft standard links. It customizes where these go. So if you've got some documentation or a help desk, etc. Um, here's receive email notifications for service outages and incidents, right? I've got that set to my Power BI administrators. And I've got that set one as a mail enabled security group um, since it's getting notifications. Workspace settings. This is a big one. So who can create workspaces? And sort of back to your philosophical discussion of, huh, can anybody in the organization create a workspace? So my last project, um, I was working with a chemical company and they said, oh, no, only a very small number of people can create workspaces um, because they, they didn't want it to suddenly be hundreds of workspaces. Um, I'm working with a healthcare company right now, and their um, uh, uh, rules, policies for creating teams, creating SharePoint sites is wide open. So that means Power BI workspaces are kind of following that. It's very free and wide open. Um, but again, we're going to use audit logging and know who's doing what where, uh, but we're not going to lock down the who can create a workspace. Um, this idea of using data sets across workspaces, that's a new thing called shared data sets. And you've already heard me say a couple of times about reusing an existing data set and doing live connection. That's what makes it work. Um, I would think it should always be allowed for everybody. Um, here's a couple of those brand new preview features that I haven't turned on in this tenant yet. Um, but these are some of those uh, sensitivity and protection type features. Um, here's where we would find, um, can you share content with someone outside of the organization? Yes or no? Um, most organizations scale this back somewhat anyways. Um, publish to web, so we're going to talk about embedding in just a little bit, but um, this is, who can publish a report and have it literally be view viewable publicly. That's usually turned off completely and only, you know, allowed for very, very few people. So in my demo test here, I call that my high privilege public publishing group. Um, here's who can export data. So I had one customer once that has a ton of sales turnover. Their answer was, we don't allow any data exports, right? Because, you know, people were stealing customers. Right. So, is that the right answer or not? I don't know. But you know, you you can control some of these. Uh, what you can export, what you can print. Um, certification is a is a very uh, important new thing now. So, if I pop back over here and we go back to that, I can put the wrong thing there. Um, promoted and certified. This is our way for users that are going to create reports from data sets that already exist. Those are, those are the ways uh, with these endorsements that they can know. Oh, okay, <coughs> certified, usually um, what that, with the customers I've worked with so far, usually what that means is, well, that's being published by the central BI group or the analytics team or something that, you know, we know that it's gone through uh, rigged change management, et cetera, subject matter experts have certified it and so forth. Promoted is a little bit more loose. Um, and that maybe your power users in the org say, hey, I want you to be able to use this, but um, you know, it's, it's something below certified. Um, and that's controlled in the tenant settings. 
Let me see if there's anything else here. Uh, content packs. So um, the notion of organizational content packs are deprecated. If you have any, um, you're going to want to migrate those uh, those away. Uh, there's a few that are less commonly necessary. Um, certified visuals. So over at PowerPoint Desktop, um, we didn't talk about visuals, but over here is kind of all built-in visuals. There is a whole library of um, custom visuals that you can use, and the uh, the recommendation is that you enable this to say only certified custom visuals can be used. And if it's certified, that means it's been through some initial testing by Microsoft, right? At a bare minimum, Microsoft has verified that that custom visual does not send any data back to its own server, right? Um, so it's a it's a good thing to only use certified. Um, this setting, though, only controls your experience in the Power BI service. To do the same thing over at Power BI Desktop, you've got to do that through your policy. Uh, here's some audit stuff. Da, 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 da. Um, here's who can do some embedding of content. Uh, we need to talk about embedding soon. Um, and data flows. We need to talk about data flows as well. So lots of lots of tenant settings there. All right. I think we've gotten through the majority of that. This right here is kind of your cheat sheet, if you will, for my workspace. We only want you to use that for personal purposes. App workspace. We want you to use that for um, producing content with your team. And then there's this notion of an app when you need to distribute content broadly. Um, let me show you what that looks like real quick here. So back in the workspace, I had, um, next to every report, I had a little toggle for, yeah. At some point, you should take 500 Oh, that's what you were, <clears throat> oh. Oh. Yeah, let me let me do that. We will take a five minute break. Um, every item in the workspace has a little toggle for should we include it in the app or not. So what we have here is this really nice experience for delivering content. So where this works great is I have 150 salespeople, right, that need to review this set of reports. Let me give it to them in a nice. Uh, easy to use menu, which is more friendly than that workspace interface you just saw. I can even create pages that link you um, out to other hyperlinks, etc., etc. So that's why I tend to say apps are for broad content distribution. Not to say if the three of us work on a team, we wouldn't use an app, but usually if you're talking about a small team of people, we usually just you know, get by with using the workspace. It's usually the larger groups that have kind of makes a little more sense. Um, okay, yeah, let's take um, a quick five minutes. Um, I'm not going to go through these. We talked about a bunch of this stuff. This is just on the slide deck, like the top reasons for why you want to use the Power BI service. Uh, because sometimes people say, well, I've got Power BI desktop and I've got the file system. Why do I need that web service? So there's just a, a bunch of reasons there. Licensing, because everybody asks. Uh, you can use a Power BI free license and still have my workspace. As soon as you're ready to start using those app workspaces and you're ready to start collaborating with others and use the sharing feature or the app workspaces, you're suddenly in, you need a Power BI Pro license. Um, retail of that is ten dollars per user per month. Capacity licenses. So we're going to talk about premium in a few minutes. That is a different scenario. That is when you buy your own dedicated capacity. I'm going to buy a certain level of CPU and memory, etc. Um, and we'll talk about why you want to do that here in just a little bit. But that's kind of your two ways that you would uh, pay for your Power BI service. Uh, functionality. All right, so outside of the 
Power BI service. We do have some other alternatives. Um, Power BI Airport Server, we, we've touched on this already. So this is our on-premises alternative. If you already have a huge investment in reporting services, that's where this really makes sense. Um, the two ways you would get a license for that, one is if you've got an enterprise license with software assurance, Airport Server comes with it. And if, at these days, if you're going to run Power BI, I'm sorry, if you're going to run SQL Server reporting services, it's almost like you might as well make it a Power BI report server and allow to report types. The other thing that's interesting is if you have Power BI Premium, that capacity license that we just mentioned, they give you a report server for free, which is kind of interesting. Um, but it, it's, uh, it helps organizations that maybe aren't quite ready to do everything in the cloud and uh, have that hybrid choices for when things get published. All right, so let's talk embedding for a minute. Has anybody ever researched embedding Power BI content and got really confused really fast? So if you're going to go down this road, plan to spend some time researching because it, it is confusing. So I'm going to try to lay out your options for you. Um, it's going to be really high level, but let me lay them out for you um, so you kind of know your different options. First one is called organizational embedding. That's your PSKU or Power BI Premium, right? There's also this thing called an EM SKU, and um, what do they call it? You've got to have a... Uh, like you can't buy it through the Office 365 portal, you gotta go through your Microsoft rep. There's a term for it that's escaping me. But um, that, the, the P SKU is the one that most people purchase. If you've read anything that says user owns data, you're talking about this type of embedding. So this is where uh, you're usually talking about a custom app. And I want to embed a Power BI report inside my custom app. Then there's what they call embedded analytics. This is an A SKU. This is Power BI embedded way to purchase capacity from an Azure service instead of Office 365. So it gets complicated fast, right? Um, this is targeted primarily to software vendors that say, oh, I have a, I have a piece of software that I'm going to sell to customers and I want to embed Power BI uh, as my report tool inside it. That, a bunch of the documentation calls app owns data. I personally do not find either one of those the slightest bit intuitive, but they're in the documentation. And then there's this notion of public embedding, so publish to web. So this is more about, oh, I want to go embed a Power BI report in an iPhone on my phone, right? So the, the thing here is, is that even though the documentation talks about this is used for organizations and this is used for ISVs or software vendors, right? They can absolutely be flip flops. So I've seen an organization run their embedding on ASUS and I've seen um, internally uh, the, the opposite. So when you want to generate an embed code, let me show you what this looks like in the, in the portal so you know what I mean. So let's say I am in a report. Let me go back to my favorite workspace here. And we just look at nice and slow. Yeah. Usually the Wi-Fi here is way faster than my phone hotspot, but there we go. All right. So here inside the report, under this ellipsis, there's a whole bunch more options that we haven't talked about, but one of them is embed, and there's three options. Now I'm only seeing this uh, third one uh, because I, I have permissions. So if I if I were to click on one of these. It's basically generating an embed code, and it's giving me something that I can go and you know embed elsewhere. An admin 
if I pop back over to my uh, that's right. Um, an admin has a list of the embed codes that they can refer to and say who has generated embed codes and what are they so that if you need to kind of turn around and audit, well, where is this, where is this being embedded if you can. So you can generate a secure, so these are those three options, right? You can generate a, what they call a secure embed code for um, inside a custom app or whatever. And so anybody here know, know JavaScript, right? You can do lots of magical, cool stuff with that, right? So this is the one for using with custom apps. There's a separate one for SharePoint Online, um, and uh, apparently it acts a little bit different. So it's basically designed to work with a web part that, that talks to SharePoint. Um, and that comes to mind as, you know, maybe something that you can look into. Um, and then there's the public facing event code. And so those are those are kind of your three options and uh, it, it works out really nicely for your for your user community. Um, most most of it happens over here. You can also um, over say in something like teams, right? You can create a little tab, you can say, oh I want to show a, a Power BI report, right? That's kind of, that's embedded in Teams, but it's not generated the same way. So there are other scenarios like that. So just showed you where those are done at. So um, for your folks that are on the move, there is a mobile app. So the key to being able to view content inside the mobile app is that it has to be published to the Power BI service. Um, and then for the system administrators, uh, that have Intune uh, deployed, right? That'll allow you to do things like, oh, the device was lost. You know, we want to send the, we want to wipe the, the data or anything of that nature um, that you, allows you to manage that mobile device. There's also a Windows app um, that you can get out of the Windows Store or Microsoft Store, they call it now, and that's more of a tablet experience than the mobile app is, um, and. Uh, recently, in the last few months, they they added in some new functionality. So, anybody at the office have monitors like yes. your hallway or something, right? You've got a report either flipping through or just static of maybe your your goals, how how you're trending or whatever. Um, the Windows app works really nice because then you can kind of tell it to cycle through these four reports at such and such interval. So, um, that's pretty cool. All right. So let's talk about the gateway. So we said earlier that the gateway is all about connecting to that data that is on premises. So sitting behind your firewall and you've got to be able to get to it securely somehow. Sometimes the documentation says, well if your data's in the cloud, you don't need a gateway. And that's not always true, right? So if you've got your cloud data secured behind a VNet and firewalls and VPNs and all that stuff, you're still going to need a gateway. So it's not an absolute only on premises. Um, it it kind of depends on how your, your cloud environment's configured. So, what's happening here is, you know, let's say this is a SQL Server sitting in your data center, right? And Power BI or one of these other services um, is connecting through the gateway that's installed on a server, not a computer underneath the desk somewhere, right, uh, that's able to connect to that data source, right, so in the domain or whatever. And then it, it does this, uh, this secure connectivity between the cloud service and any data center. There's two modes to the gateway. We like the standard mode, they used to call it enterprise mode, and I can't let that go, I still call it enterprise. Um, and then there's the personal mode. So the standard mode is set up by an administrator and it's intended to be used um, by anybody who would give permission. The personal mode means, oh, you're gonna set that up on your laptop 
and run your own little personal gateway. What a terrible idea. It's all about self-service BI and enabling the, uh, sure. the population of users that need to get things done and be productive, right? Um, it now can be disabled. So um, I'll show you what the, the Power Platform Admin Center looks like. Uh, and there's some new PowerShell commandlets. You can basically say um, the personal mode is not allowed in our environment. So if somebody tries to install it, it just won't work. And most every company I've worked with <laughs> does that. Um, the standard mode says, hey, I can connect to that SQL Server uh, for importing data. Let's say we're doing direct query through single sign-on. I can do that, right? I can I can use those all those modes that we talked about before. Where's the personal mode? He can't he can't do direct query in live connection. Um, that range of tools. So all of them up here. That only applies to our the big guy, the guy on the left. The personal one is Power BI only. And every data source must be configured. So let me let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say I've got a gateway, and I'll show you what it looks like in the services set. Let's say I've got a gateway, and then I've got, say, a SQL Server, maybe a Oracle database, and maybe a folder with some files underneath it uh, sitting on, uh, we'll say share. Um, the, the need for each one of these to be registered in the gateway is a good thing, right? That's a data governance thing. That means we know where throughout the entire tenant where the data is connecting from. Granted, you can still hit some cloud services without a gateway, so it's not an absolute, but it's still a good thing. And then what happens is administrators are configured at the gateway level, users are configured at the data source level. And what I mean by that is who sees this data source so that I can set up data refresh. So one of you asked about data refresh earlier. And if we go into the service, and let's start with, let's say I want to look at, so I'm on the data sets page, and maybe for this call center stats, I'm going to go into the settings. And this guy here, um, already knows that he's supposed to use my gateway that I call this, right? Oh, yep, my VM that I have it running on is, is up and running, life is good. This right here is a terrible message, and, and I've given feedback that says, if you found a standard gateway for this data source, don't show this. You know, this makes a user think. Oh, I need to do something when they absolutely do not. So don't be fooled by that. This is basically just saying, I am a user. I can see this particular data source, which is an adventure work saying database. So I'm still in the data source properties, right? So schedule refresh, if I were to enable this here, I can then say, you know, daily, weekly, what day a week, what time. In with regular Power BI, we haven't talked to premium capacity yet for features. I can schedule a data refresh up to eight times a day. Yeah, um, premium is up to 48 times a day. Now over on the gateway side, so here where I'm at is in the gateway management area. So here is my gateway. So here's where I have got um, who my administrators are. And then here's that data source. So it's the data source name, it's got um, a username and a password stored as part of the definition of this data source. Where is the SQL Server? Is this in Azure or on This one happens to be sitting in a VM in Azure. Yeah, so by virtue of it sitting in a VM, I still need a gateway. Um, and then here's my users. So if I'm in this list 
that means if I need to schedule data refresh, I can find that data source. So that's what that user list really means. So wait, that's Okay, so that's your whirlwind tour of gateways. You know, the biggest thing to watch out for there is just, oh, if I need to implement some sort of row level security, right, you have to start aligning gateway credentials since those are stored with who can see what if it's different for division. There's some planning considerations there. Premium, okay, we've alluded to this a few times. So you already know now that we've got the notion of workspaces, right? And Power BI is a shared capacity, right? That software as a service, multi-tenant service, right? With the user-based licensing. We talked about the free and the pro licenses. When we get into premium, then we're talking about capacity-based licensing. And what happens when I buy capacity is then I put certain workspaces into that capacity. Why do I want to do this? Here's a whole slew of reasons, right? We've got the biggest one that usually makes people look at this is I have a huge group of people that I need to distribute reports to. They are read-only consumers. They don't need to publish content. They don't need a pro license. They just need to read. And the, um, the math usually works out to about 500 read-only users because Power BI Premium Retail anyways is $5,000 a month. Um, and that's that's just for one capacity, right? It goes it goes up from there. So you know the math starts to work out of oh I've got so many consumers, um, but we get a whole bunch of extra features as well, right? If you need dedicated hardware, um, things like incremental refresh, those paginated reports that we talked about, the RDLs, those are only premium right now. Uh, you need to specify, ah, this particular workspace needs to live in uh, Ireland. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, larger data set sizes, this is still coming. So right now we're still limited to uh, one gigabyte compressed for a single data set size if I'm in shared capacity, and three gig compressed in premium. And it's going to go up like huge, 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 like I think they're talking about up to 400 gig. Um, so huge. So that's you know starting to say, oh, it can compete with analysis services types of models being over a Power BI premium because a Power BI data set is analysis services under the covers. Um, refresh rate, so basically that means that 48 times a day, right, instead of eight. Um, things like data flows and hooking in with AI cognitive services and blah 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 blah. So you get the point. Now there's this trick. I just said premium's $5,000 a month, right? Well, let me show you real quick first what this looks like. Okay. My uh, fonts are messing me up here. There we go. So if I go back to my admin portal and I go to capacity settings, I do not have $5,000 a month to uh, pay for a demo environment. So there's a workaround. I'm going to show you what it is. When this comes up, you're going to see that there's two pages. One is, I bought Power BI Premium through Office 365, the, which I have not because the entry point is so high. The other is, I bought that ASKU Power BI embedded through Azure and hooked it up to my Power BI tenant. Now, the reason that that turns out to be something I can do is because I'm going to run that for like two hours tonight and spend 20 bucks, right? So, huh, I can pause it when I don't need it. You can only do that with the Azure service. You can't do that with the true premium service. But anyways, what that does is that allows me to show you a couple things that are important to know about premium. One of them is I have purchased, uh, come on, there we go. I have purchased, you know, a set amount of CPU and memory. And then I run workloads on it. So here is my AI workload. You know, how much of my memory is it allowed to take up? 
how much is data sets, how much is data flows and paginated reports allowed to take up from this particular workload. So monitoring the health of your capacity is a very big deal. And these are the four workspaces that I have added to uh, my premium capacity. So you will see that they're right there. And I haven't refreshed. That's why sales analytics shows here, but not here. Firefox gets weird how it refreshes. Um, so it's workspace by workspace. So, all right. Last thing that I wanted to talk to you about and make sure you're aware of, I think this is last thing, is the notion of data flows. You remember when we were in Power BI Desktop, and I was showing you the query editor and those steps. That, oh, I'm going to delete this column, and I'm going to change this data type, and I'm going to append these, etc., etc. That work is within one PBIX file. And what if you want to take that work and make it be reusable? That's the notion behind data flows, is to make it um, reusable and make it so that I'm going to do this, this data acquisition once. Maybe you've got a really finicky source system. You don't want 100 people with their PBIXs hitting that source system for data refresh. No, nope. you want to pull that data out once into a data flow, do your data cleanup, then your data sets will pull from the data flow. It's just like a temporary change. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Um, so, in our thing here, we can show that I have one data flow that's going to serve these two different data sets that are no longer going to go back to um, a source system necessarily. So, what that looks like in the service real quick is that fourth or fifth area, um, right over here, if I go to my telemetry workspace, um, here I have one data flow called raw data. And if I, you know, click on customer, okay, that's my, that's my data types. And if I go in into the edit experience, this is what they call Power Query Online. So I have got this very much the same experience. This online experience is still catching up to what's in Power BI Desktop. It, it will have a feature parity. Um, it's still just a little bit newer. It's not there yet. Um, but the idea is reusing all of these steps that we did to, to tidy up the data. All right, so the last section of these slides is really just um, a few other FYI. So automation, we've got REST APIs, we've got PowerShell commandlets. There's um, this is an area that is hugely um, growing and getting better. Like six eight months ago, it, it was in much uh, worse state. So getting better all the time. Um, integration with Azure, we already talked about a, a bunch of this stuff, um, but. Uh, a lot more is happening. Um, same thing with all the security and protection type of, of aspects. Um, the auditing data is, goes into the Office 365, that unified audit log. Um, and so there's a couple different ways to get after it. Um, and there's a new one coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, they released it and had some bugs <coughs> back out, but I think it's coming soon. Um, so that's a, that's a very big deal to get at that data. And then the Power Platform. The Power Platform is uh, getting more and more features where Power Apps and Power Automate all integrating with Power BI. And then there's this, this thing called the Power Platform Admin Center. That's where they've actually moved the gateway uh, management stuff, uh, or some of them, uh, because it, it overlaps with these other things. All right, so that was like a really crazy, wild tour of a whole bunch of stuff under the sun. Any last questions or things that I can clarify for you before we break for this evening? 
What did you do with your chemical company? Wait, wait. Power BI. Yeah. So oh, it was a Power BI governance and deployment type of type of thing. So we we were helping them figure out what guardrails they really want and need. So, so yeah, it's kind of interesting to see. It, it's always fun to see how different companies view things differently, right? Um, they happen to say we're going to provide uh, the data via some SAP HANA tools, right? And after that, the users are on their own to create everything on the Power BI side. Whereas the other one I'm working on right now is more about, no, 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 the central team is going to provide all the data. We only want users to do the report side. Right? So it's, yeah, it's, there's a lot of different ways you can, you can carve that. Well, they're doing their reporting at SAP, right? I mean. It's not, uh, it's not adequate. So they're, they're basically saying, we're not going to take that away from users that want to keep using it, but Power BI is going to become the, the tool of choice. So the other tools, none of them really took off. What is your kind of company here in Charlotte or Rocket? No. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's where you can find um, this slide deck and all the other stuff. Um, let me know if there's any other questions you have, and otherwise, um, thanks for all the good questions and the conversation.